All right. YouTube Live is starting. People are rolling in. So welcome, everyone, to the Remote Contesting and DXing webinar. Your panelists for this webinar are Lee Finkel, KY7M, and Ned Stearns, AA7A. Please use the Q&A function to post any questions. They will be answered at the end of the presentation. After the webinar is closed, you may use the either email address of the presenter on QRZ to contact the panelists if you have more questions. This webinar is being live streamed on YouTube and is being recorded for later viewing. You can find information to access those videos on www.hamcation.com. Your camera does not need to be on and your microphone is muted. Also be aware there's a strict time limit for this webinar. And with that, I'd like to welcome Lee and Ned. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, this is Lee, KY7M. I'm gonna lead off and uh, give you some of the, the background on this uh, journey, which uh, actually has taken five years to uh, where we are today. And uh, the uh, CQ160 CW contest just passed us the end of uh, January was the, uh, actually the fifth anniversary of when I first operated the, uh, the station. So let's uh, start with just uh, telling you a little bit about how the, the journey began. Uh, this all uh, took place because of uh, a dream that Milt Jensen had, N5IA, who's now a silent P. I uh, became really fascinated with uh, the challenge of working DX on, on 160 top band. And uh, he lives uh, or lived in a, a little town called Verdon, New Mexico, just across the border from Duncan, Arizona, another, another uh, big, big town in southeastern uh, Arizona. And uh, he and his friend Larry, N5VG, decided they would uh, do something uh, special for 160 uh, there in town. And so they built up the NI5T contest station in Verdon. And they had some uh, really nice beverage receive antennas and a full-size 160 meter vertical at that point. But Milt uh, wasn't satisfied. Uh, he loved 160. It was, it was his, uh, his band and he loved, uh, just loved to uh, operate there and decided if one vertical was good, what about having four or eight? And uh, he had some land the family had purchased uh, just outside of Safford, which is about an hour's drive from Verdon uh, in uh, Graham County, Arizona, right in, in the shadow of Mount Graham, where uh, some big telescopes are located. And uh, so he began uh, building what uh, is now the uh, eight circle and uh, has a, quite a, a reputation around the world. There are only maybe one or two other antennas like it anywhere. There aren't any others in the US we know of at this point. 130 foot verticals, eight of them in a circle. And uh, it's just amazing to see the, uh, the, the radial wires that uh, he meticulously soldered uh, around them, miles and miles of radial wires. And then in addition, uh, there's uh, a, a, a beverage farm receive antennas that are four or 500 feet long and uh, eight of them that are bi-directional. So you have 16 directions to, uh, to listen and receive as well. And then just for fun, he added a, a, four, a full size four square for 80 meters that uh, he, uh, he put, uh, put together. So uh, this is the kind of the, the overview, uh, the, the aerial view of, of the land. And so on the left, you have the beverage farm and on the right, you have the, uh, the eight circle, uh, kind of in the middle of, on the right side, and then uh, up uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the, the northeast corner, the 80 meter four square. It also shows some antennas that we've added since then and uh, that we'll talk a little about, but we've got a, a combination 40, 30 meter four square that uh, Ned designed and, and uh, we built, and we've added 20 meter four square uh, that uh, preceded putting up a C19XR tribander on the site. And just to give you a quick view, this is uh, kind of high desert, uh, it's rugged terrain. So here's a quick uh, look around the clock here. North, northeast, to the east, southeast towards uh, South America, due south. And then we get towards Mount Graham here to the southwest and the west, uh, Mount Graham there. And then back around to the northwest, which is looking back at Safford, which uh, is where we get some noise uh, and uh, towards uh, Asia. And this is the original location of the, uh, of the station. Ned, uh, or I'm sorry, Milt bought a, a school bus uh, that uh, they used to use to travel around for uh, some of their, uh, their field day operations and uh, seventh area QSO party. And so he pulled the seats out on one side of it and put tables in. Uh, and uh, that's where the, uh, the station was originally located. How do we get involved? Well, 
uh, I had no ideas uh, about remote operating or, or anything related to it uh, until uh, we were sitting at breakfast one day. The Arizona Outlaw Contest Club uh, has been in existence now for quite a few years, a very active group. And uh, some of us were getting together for breakfast back in the good old days uh, when you could do that without uh, worrying about uh, any uh, pandemics. Milt was a member of the Outlaw Gang, although he uh, rarely uh, came up to Phoenix, but uh, he put the word out that he wasn't going to be able to operate in the uh, January 2016 uh, 160 contest, and he wanted somebody from the outlaws to uh, to operate the station. So the word came that morning at breakfast that uh, he was looking for somebody, and everybody seemed to be looking at me. The group there, uh, for those of you who are active contesters uh, from left to right, that's uh, Fred NA2U, that's me, then uh, John K7WP, uh, Bob K8IA, and then we've got uh, W7XA, who's now DU1KA uh, in the Philippines. Mike, KC7V, then Ned, AA7A, uh, John, N7NWL, formerly WA7NWL, and Mr. QRP, Gary, N7IR. So uh, at that point, uh, I was told that, uh, or I, I volu volunteered to, to uh, take on the challenge. And uh, so uh, I was in contact with Milt. He sent me the magic black box, which is the microbit RRC unit that has to be connected to the internet to access the remote station. And so uh, it took a number of phone calls and uh, some, uh, some trial and error to get the black box hooked up to my, my Elecraft K3. Uh, I had to disconnect a number of my cables to connect the black box. And then I had to figure out a way to have that talk to my internet here. Uh, but uh, we got it all set up and uh, I got to do a little operating before the, uh, the contest. Uh, I had been on 160 a little bit. I had uh, shunt fed my tower in the backyard and uh, had just barely managed to get 100 countries. It took me about 25 years to get 100 countries on 160 meters. But in the days uh, preceding the contest, uh, I got on and uh, had one magic night with uh, what uh, Ned describes as a spotlight opening to Europe. And I'd only worked to maybe two or three countries in Europe in, uh, in 25 years. Uh, I ran over 100 countries, uh, 100 stations rather, in Europe that night. And uh, so I was convinced that maybe we'd have some fun in the contest. So um, I operated, but because it's uh, 160 and all night, I recruited Fred to operate with me. And this, this picture gives you a little uh, idea of, of how we operate that station. Uh, the, that screen to the right shows the, the desktop uh, that uh, is... Uh, at, at the site, and you can see the two compasses on, on that screen. The left compass is uh, for the eight circle antenna, and with a click of the mouse, you can change the direction, any of the eight directions uh, that, uh, that you uh, need at the moment. That compass to the right is for the beverage antennas, and so with the K3, we have diversity receive, and so we're listening to the eight circle in the left ear and the beverage antennas in the right ear, and also with a click of the mouse, you can uh, point the, uh, pick any one of the, the 16 directions of the beverage antennas, makes it very effective. Uh, we did extremely well in the contest, uh, needless to say. We uh, finished first in zone three and uh, that high score west of the Mississippi. And uh, more countries, as you can see, the DX uh, in 43 countries, which beat our uh, competitors and gave us the, uh, the winning score there. So I was uh, very, uh, very, very much impressed with, with the experience. And so I, I wrote an article for NCJ uh, and uh, Milt provided the technical details and, and proofread the, uh, the article for me. And we even uh, got a cover shot, uh, not of me, you know, getting on the cover of NCJ is a big deal, but uh, we got at least a cover of the, the, uh, the site and uh, the, the bullet point there that uh, I got to play with some, some big toys in the desert. So uh, that, was, uh, that was really nice to have. And uh, the article's back there in uh, the July, August, 2016 NCJ. What happened next was uh, the, the, really the saddest part of this whole story, which uh, is that uh, first of all, the good news that um, I was allowed to continue operating uh, DXing on the station because Milt was uh, very impressed with the result that we had achieved. Uh, and that went on for a few months. Uh, my family and I took off out of the country for uh, a vacation in June. And uh, in the middle of the night, uh, I happened to read the email that, Ned, uh, that Milt had uh, had an accident. 
He uh, was working, he'd worked on towers for years and years. He was in his 70s uh, and had that uh, oops moment. Uh, nobody knows exactly what happened, but uh, he fell and, and died uh, on the spot uh, that, uh, that day in June. So some time went by, I sent a condolence card uh, to the family and, and sent a copy of the, uh, the article that had been published. Uh, and then I had to ask the question, well, you know, what's gonna happen to the station? And Ruleen uh, Milt's widow said that she uh, wanted to keep the station going as Milt's legacy. So, uh, and, and asked me if I was interested in doing that. And uh, I decided, well, I can't do that alone. Uh, and there's only one person in the world that I would uh, have uh, helped me with the technical part of that and that's Ned. So the two of us started our, our journey. So let me finish the introduction just by telling you where, where we are today after five years of this uh, journey. The station uh, continues to evolve. It's uh, just kind of an ongoing project. And it was for Milt as well. Milt, uh, when we took it over, it was, we, we looked at it as a big, uh, big breadboard kind of uh, experiment. And so he was constantly tweaking it and trying to make it better. Uh, over the, uh, the years, now you have to understand we both live in Phoenix. Uh, Safford is 175 miles away. It's a three to four hour drive each way. We've now made uh, closer to 65 trips over those uh, over the five years. And uh, in this past year, we've had some major improvements. Uh, Milt's son, one of his sons is now living on the property and uh, has uh, decided that the school bus uh, could go and uh, got a prefab building that uh, he uses for his office. And uh, one third of it uh, we now have for our station. In the bus, all the equipment was spread out on tables. Uh, Ned came up with a, a, a way to uh, rackify all the gear. And uh, so uh, it's in some very neat racks now on wheels and very easy to uh, service. And uh, as you'll see, uh, uh, Ned's replaced a lot of the switching uh, with his own designs and, uh, and, and made uh, all, all of those improvements to make the station much more reliable. We've added to the, the original 160 and 80 meter antennas, we've added antennas for, for most of the other bands now. Uh, one of the bonuses we found was the, uh, the 80 meter four square works beautifully on 60 meters. So uh, we've had a lot of fun in 60 the last year and a half uh, once we found that out. And the 20 meter four square works on 17 meters, but uh, we've got plans to, to do more for uh, the other bands. We got the, the special call sign uh, NA7TB for uh, uh, NA7 top band. And uh, so we've used that in most of the 160 contests. We've made uh, over 27,000 contest contacts with that call. And occasionally I'll get a one by one special call, uh, N7A or N7T that uh, we use for uh, some of the contests. We're using K3 radios to this day, uh, actually the basic design that uh, Milt came up with and the microbit RRC units. And they have uh, served, served us very, very well. So at this point, uh, I'll turn it over to Ned to, uh, to talk about some of the, the lessons learned and challenges of uh, having a remote station. Great, thanks a lot, Lee, uh, uh, good talk. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, one of the motivations for uh, building a remote, uh, a remote station. Um, you know, there are lots of different reasons why, why you might wanna do that. Um, uh, as, and there's a lot of side uh, benefits from that. As, as Lee had mentioned, uh, the 175 mile trip, 65 trips, uh, we could have driven around the world. Like we, we could have sh shaken hands with everybody in every DXCC in the world, it seems like, with all the driving we've done to go out to that site. So that's one of our new hobbies is uh, driving. But let's let's talk about some of the, uh, uh, Lee, go ahead and advance for me. Uh, this here's some of the reasons why you might wanna have a remote site. Well, what if you don't have uh, the antennas that you need at your property, can't fit yet another one uh, where you live? Uh, what if the ones you have aren't good enough? Uh, you know, uh, if you can make a big antenna or one that can handle power, uh, maybe you're you're uh, looking to, to operate a uh, build and operate a remote station. Um, something that uh, threatens all of us in urban areas is, is noise, and and uh, at times, uh, if you're like me, operate some FT8 uh, from time to time, you'll find that you and all your neighbors are on at the same time, and it can get pretty busy. Uh, and, and maybe you need to, to move out of town and get to a quiet location. And, but, but what we found is most interesting is that, uh, that you can create a team uh, that can uh, uh, tackle a, a, a rather substantial project like we have done with the uh, Top Band Club of Arizona that we have formed. Uh, and we have several members and, and together we, uh, we are in this adventure trying to create 
a competitive, uh, you know, operating uh, a contest station and DXing station and a fun place. It's just uh, something for everybody, gladly. However, uh, remote sites uh, introduce challenges. Uh, as, you, as I mentioned, one, the driving is a challenge, but there are several others that I'm gonna talk about. The, the main one, the one that's most interesting are the challenges of weather. Now, something you might, <laughs> something I've learned the hard way probably, is that there's a reason why these places are remote. Um, they're not really, they're hostile. They're not really uh, where people want to necessarily live. Um, I have a site, I have two sites I'm gonna talk about here in the next couple of slides that I've worked on for a remote site, one in Maricopa, Arizona, which is this flat uh, treeless plain area. And what I learned why it's so flat is because of the ferocious winds that uh, occur from time to time that, that level anything that might happen. Uh, so let me talk about a couple of these events. Uh, I'm gonna, I, I have many, uh, but I'm gonna talk on two. The first one is what we call the NN7AZ, which is the con VHF contest uh, station that we've built down in Maricopa. And we had an event or two down there. So let me talk about event number two. All right, so this is a 70 foot Roan 45 full spec uh, tower that we installed at the site and we, populated it with a, a collection of antennas, mostly for VHF, but the big thing in the, in the bottom of that stack is the 30 meter Moxon, which was a prototype antenna from Force 12, which is now gone, uh, that we that I acquired and added to the uh, to this site to add that band to the uh, owner's uh, quad, uh, uh, collection of antennas. It was a beautiful system, uh, nice seven element Yagi, ended up about 90 feet and a number of UHF antennas on the same tower. And that's what the antenna looks like at 70 feet. Uh, here's what it looks like when, uh, when you hit a hundred mile an hour wind, which we occurred one day while we were actually using the tower. Uh, the signals got very weak. Uh, and then uh, I made a joke, said, well, maybe the tower fell over and uh, one of our uh, members uh, ran over there and confirmed that we did indeed lose that tower. Uh, the uh, neighbor, uh, was was in his uh, doorway watching the storm roll in and the winds blew him into the house uh, and out his back door. Uh, and this is a big, large construction guy. Uh, and uh, my uh, engineering estimate is that we probably saw a hundred mile an hour plus wind there. Um, and nothing, was, uh, nothing really survives a 200 mile an hour impact with the ground. And uh, so we, we had to start all over uh, with the uh, with the with the project, go ahead, uh, Lee. Go ahead. So so what I've learned is that you got to do two things. You, one is you got to not repeat mistakes. You got to learn from everything that occurs. Uh, and what what we've determined that we had insufficient guying strength, and we went to uh, much much stronger filistrand guy wires up to ten thousand pound strength, and we use much better cup. Uh, mechanisms to cut, to grasp, grasp the, uh, the guy cable. Uh, and while we're at it, we can put up bigger antennas. Uh, and this has survived uh, since 2017 and it, or 2018, and it's a spectacular antenna at the top of this array now, it, or this tower is a nine element Yagi, which is a dominant, uh, produces a dominant signal on the six meter band from the Southwest. We have probably the biggest signal in the, uh, in the area from, from this station. Uh, go ahead, Lee. Let me talk my second event. Um, this is, uh, was near and dear to my heart. I, I'm a, uh, a VHF weak signal guy. I've been into moon bounce for some 30 years. And I had this a project in my mind for the biggest and best antenna that I could possibly put up. And I worked with the site owner, Larry W07R, to build the antenna of my dreams. This is a eight Yagi cross pole. Each of those antennas has two polarizations, vertical and horizontal. And uh, so I built this array from material that I've been collecting for 20 years. So uh, I prepared for this uh, build for years. We finally uh, got the tower up at Throne 55 and very, very large rotors for azimuth and elevation. And I spent a good amount of time building this and we put it on the air in 2018 and we had a tremendous uh, signal on moon bounce. It, uh, it was the best antenna, best moon bounce station I've ever had been associated with. And it worked like a champ. I just couldn't believe how good it was. However, once again, uh, we had a problem. Uh, go ahead, Lee. Uh, this time, 
Uh, the, the antenna actually survived the next storm is another monsoon storm here in Arizona. They're pretty nasty. What happened though, was part of the building that we have the station in, the uh, roof blew off that building and blew into the moon bounce array. So designed it for hundred mile an hour plus winds, but not roof uh, hitting it at hundred miles an hour. So uh, go ahead. It was a total loss, absolutely total loss. That roof landed another 600 feet away uh, further from the array and uh, left this uh, pile in its wake. Uh, so it, we, we could salvage very little from it. I had to rebuild uh, all the rotors. I had to, and we had it. We, we went with a whole new approach. Go ahead, Lee. Now this is the replacement antenna. It has about the same amount of gain. These are commercial 32 element crossbow Yaggies. But the most prominent feature about this is a smaller target to hit with buildings flying by our array that seems to happen uh, far more often than we like. So you, you have to uh, figure out what you've got. Now, something that I've learned is that uh, if you don't live at a place, you don't really know what the weather is like. Um, and you're never, when, even if you know, we've been in Safford 65 times and we've never been there during a storm. So we don't really know uh, what it's like. And we've had some incidents out there in, in Safford as well. And uh, we've lost, you know, 200 foot towers and we're struggling with getting a six meter moon bounce antenna up and running through the winds that are out there. And what we're learning is that you really, really have to have a, a large design margin. Um, uh, you know, in, you know, I, I, I'm an engineer retired and I always found it interesting that like airplane wings are designed to have 20% margin or something like that. And that's not good enough for here. I mean, you need 100% margin on pretty much everything you put up because you really don't know what the real environment is. Um, and, and, and everything that breaks, you've got you to do uh, you know, uh, an analysis to find out what actually happened and what is it I'm gonna do when I replace it with something else. And that's the only way that you can, uh, you can go forward and, and never repeat mistakes if you can help it. Uh, always look for root cause and, and figure out how to get by it with something that's better. Go ahead, Lee. The next thing I wanna talk about that's interesting is corrosion. Yeah, I know it, you know, here you are living in Arizona, everybody thinks it's nice and dry. You know, how can we possibly have a problem with corrosion? Uh, how can we compete with the, you know, the salt fog that's in uh, Florida and stuff like that? Well, we have our own problem. Uh, and, and that is uh, that the soil here is uh, very caustic. Uh, it, it's uh, pH is way away from, from uh, 7.0. And what happens when we do every once in a while get rain, uh, the rain hits the soil, creates this uh, kind of this fog of, of uh, dust uh, suspended in, in rain spatter, and it pastes uh, this uh, caustic material on every surface. And then as soon as the rain stops, the, the, the sun comes out, cooks it, and we have uh, uh, rapid effects of corrosion. Go ahead, Lee. Um, the big problem that I have with corrosion is on receive antennas. Now on transmit antennas, one thing you have going for you is that every once in a while, if you do have an intermittent joint and you put <clears throat> kilowatt of power through the joint, it welds and it gets fixed. Uh, but at receive antennas, you don't have that. Every, every time you have a, a dissimilar metal that starts to uh, develop a, 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 a sort of a, a, you know, turns metal into salt and, uh, and stops conducting, it really affects receive systems pretty badly. Uh, we've struggled with this with the beverage system that Milt had produced. He purchased these uh, quote uh, hermetic unquote boxes from uh, some ham who touted their, their, their capability. Plus he used these uh, connectors to uh, can apply DC power to these units or not to, to connect the antenna elements to the, to the uh, feed assemblies using what's called tip jacks which are slightly metalized pins that, uh, that uh, engage the moment you insert them. But over the course of time, the metal uh, uh, turns to uh, salt and, and, and garbage and stops acting like a, a conductor. So we, we struggle with getting these all to work. Uh, another problem is that he had this control system for these beverage antennas, which uh, were built on printed circuit boards, which were in an uncontrolled environment. And these printed circuit boards uh, slowly, uh, essentially rotted out. Uh, the circuit tracks just started disappearing. And I was all the, uh, out there all the time trying to figure out how to make this, this design of his to continue to work. And I was out there uh, you know, soldering and jumper wires to replace tracks that had uh, broken all the time. Go ahead, Lee. 
So, you know, but to figure this out, I had to take it home and trace out circuits. And, and I spent uh, a lot of time trying to figure out what the heck he did to make this 16 selector switch work. Uh, and, and it's funny, after three years of maintaining this thing and replacing the unit finally with a new box, as I was installing the box inside that cabinet that you saw in the previous photo, back in the corner underneath a whole bunch of, of, uh, of spider webs was a little piece of paper. And I reached in there with my gloves on, pulled out that piece of paper and voila, I finally found a schematic, but that was after I was all done replacing it. But go ahead. So this is my, my new replacement technology, uh, no circuit boards. I use what I call space technology where all the parts are suspended in space. And, uh, and all of, you know, there's nothing that will rot out uh, uh, over time. So, uh, and, and also like I've done in every other project, anytime you're gonna fix or repair something while you're at it, put in everything you want. So go ahead and the next photo shows that this now is a, a selector box for two different uh, uh, users of the array. Now, so here with a, uh, now with a two station uh, contest setup. Uh, each station can pick whichever of the uh, beverage antennas it wants to use for uh, a receive antenna. So we've uh, expanded the, uh, the capability of the station while we were at it. And this unit has been installed and it works like a charm. It's great. And we've sent all those uh, hermetic boxes that we uh, were using when we started to use the station. We have replaced each and every one of those with uh, our own homemade uh, weather uh, much better weatherproof uh, enclosures. So the, the array is now working uh, really, really well. Uh, so, so what we've learned is that, that you've got to really study the, the metal that you use at a remote site. It, it's the first thing to go and it will uh, haunt you until you, you figure out what it takes to make things work. Uh, I we also uh, constantly, when we're out there, we walk the grounds to see if there's anything that we need to do. You never you know, you can't wait for failure. You sort of have to look at something and see if you can see degradation and then plan uh, to repair something in your next trip when you, uh, when you get out there. And that's something else that's important is that if you don't have what you need in the car, when you got there, you're never gonna fix it because there's no, you know, no good stores uh, to, for, for exotic, you know, electronic uh, stuff in, in a town like Safford, Arizona. Uh, the other thing I've learned is to, is to be careful about applying weatherproofing to uh, joints, especially mechanical joints. Uh, sometimes you build a weather trap uh, for moisture. Uh, I always like to uh, be able to see the metal and if I need to reseat metal uh, contacts to be able to do that easily with hand tools and not have to be scraping off, uh, uh, you know, your, where your environment is, you may have to have a different discipline. But we found where we are, uh, rain isn't our big problem. So we, we like to make sure we can just see the metal and make sure it's good and useful for both mechanical and electrical context. Another thing we've learned about relays, we use them on receive, is that they will themselves also develop corrosion and you have to essentially weld them uh, when they close. And you do that by having a, a little DC current path that goes through the relay at the same time as the RF signal goes through the relay. And, and the DC currents will actually weld the, weld the contacts close when, they, when the relay closes. And, and therefore makes the, uh, the relays work on the low level receive signals. Go ahead, Lee. So uh, the other <laughs> uh, part of our uh, problem out there are vermin. We have uh, 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 for our area, our problems are, are pack mice and, um, and javelina. Uh, pack mice are particularly obnoxious because they like to chew on stuff uh, all the time. We, uh, Lee and I rolled out thousands of feet of uh, control cable for these uh, Comtech Foursquare controls. And no sooner that we rolled that out and started to use the station with it, within a week, the, uh, they failed. And we drove back out there and uh, we started patching this cable, this one cable to the 4030 uh, Foursquare. And I was on patch number two when Lee said, I got about 17 more breaks ahead of me here. So it was clear that this wire was nothing but dinner for, for the pack rats out there. So after we studied the problem for a while, I realized that what we have to do is to use cables whose outside diameter is greater than the inside diameter of mice's mouths. So uh, what we found is RG59 cable was, was eaten through all the time, but RG6 was not. So, so we deployed all new control cables now are done with individual runs of uh, RG6 cable so that can lay on the ground. 
uh, and uh, it survives uh, a long time now with uh, with the uh, issues with uh, with vermin. Go ahead, Ed Lee. Uh, another area of, of particular interest is uh, is operating systems. Okay, so we we struggle with the internet like everybody does. Uh, we have a couple of issues that we we fight with. One is the uh, the jitter effect. Uh, the internet your internet provider will guarantee that they will deliver a certain pile of, uh, of kilobytes of data for whatever a unit of time. They just don't know exactly when it will get there. Uh, so you, if you're sending, tapping out CW or sending a, uh, a timing critical signal like uh, FT8 or something across the internet, uh, uh, it, it can be interrupted or modified uh, badly by the effects of uh, jitter in the internet. Uh, so we have go gone to uh, creating an isolated uh, local area network out at the site, all uh, station control, all station uh, software uh, runs on the PCs and the local LAN, and we connect to the, the, the heads that we access the heads of each of the computers using uh, a software to be able to control the, uh, the stations. Uh, but we have to be sure that we can, we can gain access to the, to the stations to do that. Uh, we also make sure that uh, operating systems don't cause the station to stop working. One of the big problems we ran into for a long time was that the audio, uh, the, uh, we were using the onboard, um, on the motherboard audio chipset. And all the time, the operating systems are upgrading the drivers for those things. And, and every time there was a software update, you had to retrain the, the uh, operating system, what your configuration was of using those audio interfaces. And it required you to manually plug in a headphone jack to do that. And if you're not, you know, if it's a remote site, we had to get in it once again, jump in the car, drive out there, plug in a connector, drive home. Uh, so we've gone to uh, off board, actually out of date uh, uh, sound card systems that don't have any more software updates and don't require this uh, reprogramming. So uh, final recommendations I have on, on computers that are run this way is to set the BIOS so that they boot on the application of power. And then we control the, the site by having an IP power switch where we can turn on and off every computer remotely. Um, and that has saved our bacon uh, uh, since then. Um, we also use, to, to access the head of the computer, we've tried uh, TeamViewer, uh, that has uh, hit a snag with us. We, we can't seem to use that without being a power uh, paying user. Uh, so we stopped using that and we use two applications. We use our tight VNC and real VNC. Tight VNC scales, we can add people all the time and that's the one we prefer to use. But you're gonna need to learn how to, how to manage the access to the site through your router um, as a subject for a, a whole other talk, not gonna cover that today, but that's something that you've gotta be able to do. We could have gone with a VPN. I know a lot of people use virtual private networks to go to remote sites, but that didn't solve our problems with the cadence of the CW um, and digital signals. So we, we, we don't go that approach. And so we, we uh, take the approach we have where all the apps are run on the, on the outside service. Uh, and, the, and the last thing is that whenever you are out there, uh, some uh, OS upgrades really, really need to, you need to be on site. So we, whenever we're out there, we, we, we conduct the, all of the outstanding updates that we can uh, for the sites. So I'm going to turn it back over to Lee for the balance of the stuff. All right. <clears throat> well, I think I uh, wanted to talk about team building uh, <clears throat> and, and uh, it's uh, really important to, uh, to have, have people who can, uh, Work uh, work together, and and uh, we've got a, a good core group at uh, at at our site here that uh, uh, has uh, we've limited the operating. I mean, people have asked us from time to time about uh, joining in uh, uh, on the team, but because we've had so many problems with uh, reliability, it's uh, made it difficult to uh, just open open it up. So we've uh, we've kept it to a group of four, or actually five. Uh, in terms of people who uh, who operate uh, with us in, in the contests, and uh, you know everybody brings their own uh, their own skills, uh, but uh, you really need to have common goals and, and have some agreement about what uh, what you're going to do uh, at the remote station. Uh, we've been pretty good about, uh, uh, especially when we're DXing, <clears throat> if something rare comes up, where uh, we each have a uh, uh, either a uh, an Elecraft Mini uh, or K Zero. 
uh, with our, our control RRC unit. And uh, because we each have one of those, it's, it's pretty quick to hand off, uh, which is something that we do in contests now. Uh, we, can have, uh, we can have four people uh, doing a multi-op and uh, we'll do three hour shifts. <clears throat> we just did that in the, uh, this, this latest uh, CQ160 contest. Uh, we, uh, I make up a schedule ahead of time and everybody knows when they're going to operate. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm operating and, uh, and Fred NA2U is coming on next, uh, he, he tells me we use Slack for a chat. And so he'll tell me on Slack, hey, I'm QRV, I'm ready. It's coming up on the hour. So as soon as we hit that, uh, that uh, magic zero, zero uh, for the hour, uh, I'll uh, say, okay, go. And I hit control O, so we change operator on N1MM and uh, uh, the next person takes over. And that's worked very effectively for us. So uh, anyway, uh, there needs to be some care about who's, who's gonna participate. Uh, that really hasn't been an issue for, uh, for us here. <clears throat> Let me talk a little bit just to finish up about uh, what we've been able to accomplish, both in terms of contests and, uh, and in DXing. Try to leave uh, some time here for, uh, for some questions. We, uh, we did want to have a, a call sign and, and make the, uh, the station, uh, the Milt Johnston Memorial Station, that was very important for us. And so uh, I, I, uh, because we couldn't get uh, either of Milt's old calls, uh, I requested an NA7TB and we got that from the, from the FCC in, uh, in September of, of 16. And uh, we've been using that in most 160 contests and in uh, seven, seven QP, the seventh area QSO party. We've made over 27,000 cues uh, using uh, our, uh, our club calls, uh, but uh, we use our personal calls for DXing and occasionally for, for contests where we're doing an individual effort. And so a whole lot more than that uh, in the, uh, the five years we've been operating. Some pretty good achievements. Uh, if we're on, especially in the 160 contest, we rule. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to operate. Uh, we, we have some competition from uh, one of the stations up in Utah and uh, they, they beat us out in, uh, in 2018, but most of the time <clears throat> in the, uh, the CQ 160, we do very well. Uh, we're not big sideband fans, but we have gotten on we feel obligated to, uh, to operate in any 160 contest uh, because it was Milt's favorite band. And even on sideband, we've, uh, we've managed to, uh, to, to do okay. Same thing with AWRL, uh, although we've now, AWRL DX, um, the 160 contest, but we've also operated in the, uh, the general DX contest and we've done very well there with our, uh, our C19 tri-bander. We do extremely well on HF bands. And then at night, uh, we wait for the night because we know we can do very well on 80 and 160. So uh, that's just a quick overview of uh, what we've done. We have a lot of fun in the 7QP. Uh, we, we do multi-op with that and, uh, and we've done extremely well. I've got, I've got more plaques and wall space uh, here and uh, we're gonna start taking some of those down and put them up in our, uh, our new location in, uh, in Safford. Back after the, uh, the 160 AWRL, uh, 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 contest uh, in 2016, uh, we were asked for uh, a copy of the, our QSL card and uh, we got a nice little write up about the, uh, the station. And uh, we finished uh, fourth in uh, the multi-op uh, uh, and uh, the uh, top station west, of the, uh, west uh, of the Mississippi there. And, and until recently, we uh, well, when we could still get together, our, in the earlier days of the the multi of the uh, the remote, we would uh, get together. Fred would come over to my shack to operate, uh, and uh, in this case, so we operated uh, AWRL 2017 from uh, Ned's dining room table. Uh, his wife gave permission to uh, to uh, take over the dining room for uh, for that weekend, and uh, so Ned got uh, got everything set up, and uh, he's. Uh, Trying to figure out if anybody's going to answer. Uh, sometimes we have a problem here on the on the uh, west coast uh, being heard uh, over in Europe, but uh, we we did uh, very very well. The other thing that's been a lot of fun for us uh, is is DXing, and uh, maybe the most spectacular contact uh, since we've been operating. Uh, I can I can demonstrate here uh, for those of you who know what Gray Line is, the Terminator where uh, uh, day meets night. Uh, you have this uh, this enhancement effect, and uh, this is from uh, the, uh, the CQ, uh, CW contest on 160 uh, on January 29th of 2017. Uh, it was just past sunset uh, uh, and uh, so uh, we still had some twilight going. Uh, and um, I got called by uh, FR4NT 
uh, Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean. And uh, after I got up off of my chair, uh, finished the contact, he was 599. I could not believe it. And I got an email from him very shortly after that, wanting to know what antenna I was using. So I uh, uh, had a big smile on my face when I explained to him that we were uh, using an eight circle on 160. So all, all of us, uh, <clears throat> the four of us who are uh, the, the regulars uh, are, are chasing new ones on 160, 80, and now on 60 meters. And uh, Ned, one of the reasons he wanted to get involved with the station was that uh, 160 was one of the places where he could get uh, finally get to uh, 3000 and uh, on the DXCC challenge. And he finally accomplished that uh, here uh, a year or so ago. And uh, it's the first one this far west to, uh, to do that. And I'm all the way up to 2875. I don't know if they'll get to 3000, but uh, I'm uh, on my way. So we've had uh, more of the gray line thrills, uh, FR4NT, but then we had uh, 9G5X uh, in Ghana, uh, right at sunset. Sometimes we have to send emails to uh, the, the operators, uh, the European operators that uh, go on these expeditions to remind them when our sunset is. And uh, so we've had this kind of enhancement effect several times where they'll just come up uh, right at sunset out of the noise and uh, we were able to work them and then uh, they, uh, they kind of fade away again. And I already talked about uh, the, the spotlight openings, but we, we live for those, uh, don't see them as often. And of course, a lot of the, the daily or nightly activity on 160 these days is on FT8. So uh, uh, it's a little bit harder to spot them on CW, but we're also monitoring FT8 quite a bit. Plans for the future? Well, we're, uh, we're working more and more towards uh, multi-two operating. We've just put up uh, a VA6AM system of uh, a triplexer, high power triplexer, as well as uh, filters for all the bands so that uh, we can do multi-two and be operating on 80 and 160 at the same time without interfering with each other. Uh, so we're gonna be uh, do actually doing some experimenting with that uh, in the uh, ARRLDX coming up next weekend. We're adding a 64-foot self-supporting tower. Uh, actually, just got the hole dug for that, and uh, we've already got a, a plans to put up a uh, an M squared KT36. Uh, so we'll have that as well as our C19 for the HF bands. We've got a Cushcraft 40-2 uh, uh, CD that uh, Ned has reinforced uh, in advance for 100 mile an hour winds, uh, trying knowing that we may have those. Originally, this is going to go up on top of a 200-foot internet tower that. Uh, uh, crashed down uh, Thanksgiving a uh, year, uh, over a year and a half ago. Uh, but uh, we're saving it now to go up on this uh, new tower. And then we've got an M squared, a 6M7 GHV for six meters that is up uh, on a, a Wilson 40 foot tubular right now that uh, we're just starting to play with. So uh, we're getting uh, a lot more experience uh, on, on the other bands, a lot more uh, flexibility. flexibility. And then the other thing that's going on that uh, Ned started uh, a couple of years ago now is to work uh, with ARRL on conducting a noise research study, collecting uh, data using the beverage antennas. And uh, he has just finished uh, writing a, a series of four papers uh, documenting his initial findings on that. And that's an ongoing project for us. Well, we just wanted to to give you an idea on what, what our journey was like and to let you know that, uh, well, it's nice uh, if you've got the money to just uh, pay uh, RHR to uh, rent a station for a weekend. Uh, there are those of us that uh, uh, have deed restrictions and maybe looking for other solutions that are more permanent and uh, less expensive in the long run. Although uh, running a remote station, I can tell you is not cheap uh, if you're uh, going to put up any, any serious hardware and maintain it. But uh, it may, may well become the new hobby for, uh, for some of, uh, some of the, uh, the people that are living in, uh, in restricted communities, uh, or at least provide an option that uh, uh, will let them do more serious contest operating than uh, operating with uh, something hiding in the attic or under the eave of, uh, of the roof. We, uh, <clears throat> we always remember Milt, especially when it's uh, 160 time, and uh, uh, we have him on our, uh, our, our QSL card uh, with, the, with the name of the station. And uh, we're gonna have to replace that uh, school bus at some point uh, with a different picture down at the bottom. But uh, uh, we, uh, we, we like to remind ourselves that uh, this is based on his dream that uh, the station was founded and uh, we're, we're trying to preserve that and have it live on. So that's the end of uh, the slides uh, that I've got and uh, we can open it up for questions.
Ned, anything else you wanted to add? No, let me, let's just go over to the uh, comments that are, that are over there. Um, uh, so someone asked whether we are running Linux and, uh, and no, it's everything is a uh, Windows based uh, DOS. DOS, where'd that come from? Windows, uh, Windows 10. Uh, it's what I know and understand. Uh, uh, so that's, that's where we got. Uh, someone is mentioning uh, another option from type VNC is tail scale. I'm going to write that down and look at it. Always looking for, for new ideas. Uh, 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 there are some issues I'm finding with type VNCs. We're, we're having socket failures uh, all the time. And we have to uh, figure out how to get through that. Um, uh, okay, there's some... <laughs> Okay, someone asked, why such a passion for 160? That's a good question. Um, well, Milt had the passion. I mean, uh, you know, all the time we were reminded of how incredibly driven Milt was. I mean, I've been a ham for 60 some years and uh, an engineer, retired engineer, and I, I'm very passionate about that, but I don't hold a candle to, uh, to what Milt did. He spent four years uh, building this antenna, uh, you know, just, day and night. Uh, he enlisted some help from friends, but he had this dream, this vision. They wanted this thing uh, to exist that, that addressed all of the shortcomings of every antenna he ever had. And why 160? Well, it's the toughest band, I mean, uh, short of going into moon bounce. Uh, it is the, the ultimate challenge uh, on the HF spectrum. Uh, uh, maybe now we have the VLF bands, but, but 160 is, is, the, is what tests your ability to copy under adverse conditions and be able to emit a you know reasonable signal with any antenna that's a, is you know smaller than a, a, a well you know we obviously made the biggest antenna you can possibly make probably and and that's one solution that but not for everybody but he was just driven to get to that point and we are driven to keep it running. So uh, somebody was asking about uh, have we monitored our our operations. Uh, uh, locally, we, yeah, we we know there's a very slight delay, but it's never really been an issue. Uh, actually, you notice that when we li listen to ourselves in the monitor, it doesn't bother us much on CW. We hear it more if we're in a voice contest, but uh, uh, I don't think it would make any difference in our in our score. Or if it would, it'd be awfully slight. Yeah, one thing I've learned is that uh, when you're operating FT8, you can take the headphones and you can put them on the desk, and you just look at the screen, and nothing hurts. Uh, when you operate 160. All right, uh, per perhaps I missed it. What remote software are you using to control the transceivers and run the audio over IP? Okay, a couple of different things there. Uh, we control the radios using local software uh, operating on PCs and right next to the radio. Uh, N1MM plus for logging, WSJTX for uh, digital uh, waveform generation. Uh, IP uh, audio is transported using the remote rig uh, equipment. There's two boxes, one at the remote site, uh, that's called the, the uh, remote unit, and then one that looks the same almost uh, is the control unit, the one that's sitting uh, in your shack connected to a, uh, for us it's either the K3 Mini or the K3 uh, Zero. That, uh, that's how we get audio back and forth. Um, there is a migration towards a, a software solution for all of that, and I, and I hope that, I mean, if I were to build this again, I would take a different approach, but we started with what uh, Milt left behind using the remote rig uh, interface. Let me, there's a question uh, about uh, being that far west, uh, are you able to run Europe during contests on 160? The answer is no. Uh, and that's because of the East Coast wall. Uh, what we have to do, what we try to do in the, the last contest was to operate higher up in the band so there's less chance of, of QRM in the East Coast, but you have to wait you really have to be patient. Uh, there, we, we had a couple of Europeans uh, that we worked, usually it's S&P, but uh, if conditions are perfect and the frequency is open, we'll start getting called. And I was the operator uh, and it was about 0400, 0500 uh, uh, this last contest. And all of a sudden uh, that opening happened and uh, I started getting calls. And so I've got a page where I've got uh, 30 or 40 uh, Europeans uh, in an hour, and that's a good hour for us out here. It's nothing. We we can't compete with W2GD on the East Coast. They never will. And no. uh, but this station, if any station can do it, uh, we can do it. 
Right. Question is, do we sign portable seven when operating your station, the station with my call, our call? And the answer is no. It's a real disadvantage to add more uh, length to your call sign. Um, and you don't have to per FCC. And you might say, well, how does someone know where you are or how they know you're not in New Mexico? I'm like, well, sorry. Uh, how do you know where anybody is these days where their call signs could be, can have any number in them and they could be any, in any state. Uh, when we're on uh, digital modes, we do have the grid square, um, but we're operating and signing and uh, issuing the right information when we're in contest. Uh, we're in Arizona still out there. And if someone's looking for the grid or for the, uh, the ITU zone or whatever it is, we do upload logs with the appropriate uh, QTH information. So uh, you will get uh, credit for any contact we made when using that. Yeah, the uploads to LOTW uh, will show either DM52 or, or DM33 or 40. Here's a good one. Who does the tower climbing? Okay, that's a very good question. <laughs> These towers, uh, it looks like Rhone 25, but it's, it's more like what I call Rhone 17. Uh, it's, uh, these towers were made in Mexico. As uh, someone said who helped Milt put these up a couple of months ago, those towers used to be Chevy's. Uh, it's it's a recycled metal, not terribly strong. And our philosophy is when they fall over, we will just bid it farewell. Uh, we're, we're, we have no intention of climbing any of these towers or replacing any of these towers. We're going to run this top until it winds down. Uh, see anything. Question about the con con over low conductivity soil, what sort of radial system do you use? Any thoughts of fewer elevated? Uh, we're not going to change the radial system. Uh, the, the system, I think there's 32, 32 radials. 36,000 feet of uh, uh, radials underneath those towers. I'm not going to replace them. And when it breaks, I don't fix it. it we got plenty. There's perimeter wires. Uh, if you can picture a, a, a pizza, uh, slices of a pizza uh, coming out from each uh, each each tower. There, the the uh, the radials all go to are bonded to a, a perimeter wire uh, for each each of those slices and and a master perimeter wire around the entire array. So it's uh, just lots and lots of radial. Nothing better we could do. Okay, it looks internet, like the end of the questions I've seen here. Internet connectivity and speed at the remote location. We've got very good speed. We've got a dedicated connection now, a business, business level connection. Um, there was a question about costs. Uh, how do you divide costs? We, uh, we, that's something we, we work out our, ourselves and uh, pretty much have, have shared uh, equally as much as possible on, on the basic cost of the station. If anybody has a special project, they, uh, they fund it themselves. I apologize for interrupting, but we've hit time. Okay. Um, there's for anybody who didn't get their question answered, uh, they uh, said their email address on QRZ is good. So you can uh, direct that question to them and they'll get back to you. Uh, thank you guys very much for the presentation. All right. 73s, everybody. 73s. See you on 160. <laughs>